Thank you, yeah. It's so nice to be with all of you again uh, this year for this important program. And I was thinking before, <laughs> when I got invited to do this, you know, a year ago, we did the Hyperloop, this new technology that's being kicked around that would shoot people from Kansas City to St. Louis in 30 minutes. This year, we're doing concussions. You sort of wonder what in the world are we going to be doing a year from now. I, I'll be <laughs> eager to hear what happens there. But I hope we can offer you some, uh, some practical, reasonable advice and guidance about this very important topic as we wrestle with what to do with our kids and the sports they want to play, uh, much less the games that we all play, uh, even some of us who are older than we were when we were in high school. So let me begin by introducing our panel and we'll get started right away. Uh, immediately to my left, John Cagle, Senior Manager of Advanced Concepts at sports technology company Vices. Uh, Vices uh, was, hopefully will be again, a Seattle startup founded in 2013 that makes football helmets that Time Magazine has hailed one of the best inventions of the year 2017. The company went into receivership uh, right before Christmas. There's hope that its founders will revive it and move forward shortly. John Cagle is here. Next to John, Dr. Meg Gibson is a physician for the Sports Medicine Center at Children's Mercy Hospital. She's the head team physician for UMKC Athletics, Dr. Meg Gibson. And to her left, Tim Grunhardt, former standout for the Kansas City Chiefs for so many years, played uh, college football at Notre Dame, football uh, head coach at Bishop Miege, coached at the University of Kansas. Let's give our panel a great round of applause, if you would. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Gibson, let's start with you here. Um, you know, concussions, obviously, a very big deal. Uh, more and more people talking about this, this issue. How big a deal is this? So it's definitely something that we've seen grow a lot in the last even five to 10 years. And I think that one of the reasons we're talking about concussion more is because we're doing a better job of educating as sports medicine physician and people in the medical profession, we're doing a better job of educating patients, family members, coaches, um, athletic trainers. And then obviously with all that's gone on, you know, with some very famous football players, et cetera, right. um, the media has picked up on this quite a bit, which I think in a lot of ways has been good for what I do because it's been a way to open up some discussion. About I was going to say, why are we talking about it so much now? Because we've been playing football in this country for a whole lot of years, I think a hundred, you know, in the NFL at least. Why is it a big issue today? So I think that one of the reasons we're seeing this increase is, you know, just as science and technology have advanced and our research has advanced, if you go back even 15 to 20 years in the medical literature, concussions were barely talked about. It was kind of as when I was talking to some people earlier, you'd ask someone three words and if they could remember those 15 minutes later, you'd say you're fine. Or if they didn't pass out during a bad hit, they were fine, they could go back in. Right. Um, now, as we're doing more research, we're learning more about the brain, we're seeing, you know, so there's effects that sometimes last weeks, months, years, and then even potentially beyond that. So I think that as our research um, in this area has grown, it's really made ways for us to kind of look at it more and say, well, what can we do, obviously, from prevention, treatment, diagnosis, and all of those things. You know, Tim, you've played a lot of football in your life, 11 years for the Chiefs. You played on the offensive line, you know, obviously very aggressive, very physical. What concerns do you have about the impact that any concussions you may have experienced might have on, 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 uh, in your life at this point and, and where you are? Well, first of all, thank you guys so much for having us here. This is a great discussion. It's really needed. The sport of football needs more of this. It needs communication. It needs education. So thank you guys so much at UMKC and thank all of you guys and my distinguished uh, partners here for coming up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's always a concern. Um, I, I can only remember having one concussion. And back then in the, in the 90s when it was just starting to come about where concussions were something people were talking about, uh, they dealt with it in a different way than they do nowadays. But it's not really about the concussions. And Dr. Wackerly over here, who is our team doctor, who's a wonderful, wonderful man, can attest to this. It was more about the little hits, the little hit after hit after hit after hit that's causing a lot of the issues 
that NFL players of my age and older are dealing with. Uh, Post-mortem, there's been over 100 uh, players who've donated their brains to Harvard Medical School and their Harvard study that's going on right now. And uh, a, a good amount of those have some kind of CTE. Now, I'm not going to get into what CTE is because, I mean, there's a lot of different thoughts on, on the disease and a lot of different thoughts on how it happens, but it is there. And you always worry about the, your memory. You know, some of us can't remember where we parked our car when we come out from going to the Walmart. I think all of us have probably done that. But when you're a football player, you think, well, is this the first sign? So those are things that you worry about uh, uh, post-football career that people didn't worry about or even think about until this, this topic uh, kind of reared its, uh, its, its, its ugly, uh, ugly self uh, to the NFL and college football. What are you seeing amongst your friends, your teammates on the Chiefs for so many years? Just what have you observed as, as those guys have aged with you? Well, you see a lot of guys that obviously are having some cognitive issues, but you know, I often tell the story about really this came to be because of a man that really was important to me, and his name was Mike Webster. Mike Webster oh, was yeah. a football player who played for the Pittsburgh Steelers and then came to the Kansas City Chiefs and was my mentor. I never played the center position in college, so when I got to the NFL, my offensive line coach handed me a football and said, hey, you're a center. And I said, oh, really? I've never played it. So he said, you see that older guy over there? And this, this wasn't Mike, this was Steve DeBerg and said, hey, you need to go and snap to that guy. I said, right now? He said, yeah, go right now. So I had one snap with him, and he said, okay, you're fine. So I had one <laughs> snap before I went to my first minicab practice. Mike Webster taught me how to play the center position. Mike Webster cared enough to share his technique fundamentals and his love for the sport with me. And now, as we all know, the movie Concussion, and from that doctor who was in that movie, CTE was based on Mike Webster. And it breaks my heart that Mike... Uh, had to go through the things uh, that we all fear so much and it wasn't taken care of. And he may be here with us now if it was and it was addressed. That's why I'm so happy and so blessed that we can have these, uh, uh, these discussions. But Mike Webster, who was a wonderful, kind, gentle man who played for a lot of years in the NFL, died basically because of head injuries and trauma. How about your own kids? Do they play football, Tim? Yes, I have one son who plays football at the University of Notre Dame, and it's funny you bring that up because this year was the first time that he had his concussion. And uh, we went through all the different steps. You know, I've worn lots of hats when it comes to concussions. I've played the sport, I've coached the sport, and now as a parent of a player, you know, there's all different ways of looking at it, obviously, but it all comes down to the same thing. The University of Notre Dame and their doctors did a wonderful job of putting him through the impact test and, and and making sure that he was ready to go, and it took about two or three weeks to get back. You know, and the, and the, the crazy thing about it is it he, he wasn't that big of a hit, but when he got home and got with us, he just said he wasn't feeling good. His stomach was bothering him. So we were like, you know, maybe he's just tired. Uh, but the dog, this is the crazy thing, we have a little Shih Tzu, right? How could a Shih Tzu bother a 390-pound offensive lineman? <laughs> so this little Shih Tzu is walking around, and he had a little charm on his, on his collar. And my son is, what is that noise? What is that noise? And it was the dog's little charm that was clicking against his little tag. And it was driving him crazy. So you never know exactly what to deal with. But with your son, you're so concerned. But you have to let, we believe that the doctors and the coaches and the trainers and his own teammates, which were very, very um, helpful in this, in this situation, are there to help. But you're never quite sure, do you let him play or not let him play? But you don't, want to take, you don't want to take something away from somebody that they really and truly love, but you hope that people are there to care for him and to make sure that he's going to be healthy. And that's why, thank you, doctor, for what you do. John Cagle, do I understand right that Patrick Mahomes wears one of your company's football helmets? He does, yes. Yeah. Who else? Uh, well, I was just saying this is an interesting place to be. Uh, we have more Chiefs wearing our helmet than any other NFL team. Why is that? Uh, I couldn't tell you exactly. I'm a little more removed from sales. Um, we know that... Uh, 
There wasn't enough sales, it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we know that their equipment manager really likes us, but at the same time, NFL players do get to choose what helmets they wear. Uh, and so it does come down to personal choice for who wears which helmet. Give us a sense of what the future of Vices might be. Again, it had this magnificent run-up, uh, lots of capital from current, former NFL players. Now it's in receivership. What's the future? So we were late in development of, actually I can even back it up a step. So last year we released our 01 youth football helmet. Uh, and I think one of the things that we were really well known for in our first generation, the 01 helmet, was how expensive it was. Uh, starting off at about $1,500 and then being brought down to about $900 per helmet. And most of that reduction in cost reflected improving, improvements in manufacturing techniques but it still, wasn't, uh, it still wasn't profitable in the sense of being able to sustain a business very well. Um, the Zero One Youth Football Helmet that we released last year was a big step forward for us. Uh, and not only that, we had, uh, we had a new structure that was, it basically hit three things that was really great. It was more effective in terms of mitigating impacts. Um, and it was also lower cost. Uh, and, and easier to manufacture. Because your helmets cost like 1500 bucks at least early on. Correct. For year one, they were about $1,500. And so the, the youth that we released last year was about $450 to $500. Yeah. Uh, and, and we had taken that technology and we're moving it towards a next generation kind of adult football helmet. Hey, how did so, Vices change the football helmet? What do I get for my 1500 bucks? When you say, how does it change the football helmet? How did Vices change the football helmet? That, that, what, did it, what innovation did it bring to the helmet to make it what it was? So the, there, were, there were, I would say, two, kind of two broad categories of innovations that we brought. Uh, the, the first, and I think the one that we're maybe best known for, is uh, the buckling impact layer, which is just a singular mechanism that's different from all the other impact layers out there. Uh, the other thing that we really tried to do was engineer every component in the helmet. And I think that was something that was unique to us, especially to begin with. Uh, I, there are other helmet manufacturers who are doing good work now, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't want to downplay their efforts. Um, but I think that was something that we were really uh, almost emphatic about was our, our engineers and our engineering team, which came from uh, sports equipment background, medical, Aerospace, right. uh, and we're all trying to bring kind of the, the engineering expertise from those industries. Uh, Doctor, can a football helmet prevent concussions? So even on their website, they say that mm -hmm. their helmet is not concussion proof. And you know, one of the- There's no such thing with a helmet, right? Am I right about that? Yes, and, and so one of the, the mm -hmm. issues is, is as when we talk about the brain, um, and it's in cerebral spinal fluid, and then you have the skull and the scalp over that. So really mm -hmm. what the concussion injury occurs, it's because of what the brain is hitting kind of on the inside. You know, it's in this fluid, but it's hitting the, the movement of the, the brain skull. inside. Right. And you can have this coup and counter coup injury that we talk about. Um, so you can put things on the outside that, and helmets have, even old helmets have done a great job at preventing skull fractures, scalp lacerations, and things like that. Um, but none of those old helmets necessarily were really engineered to try to affect maybe some of these rotational forces and things like that that are, I think, you know, what we believe are causing a lot of these concussive symptoms. So, in, you know, there's really no way to put something inside of the brain to protect it. So the helmet itself, you know, is trying to go outside to mitigate some of that. Force. So the outer shell, you can't stop movement inside the skull from occurring is what you're right. saying. It's going to occur. The analogy I used when I talk to patients a lot about it, I said, just imagine you have like a raw egg and you kind of shake up the egg, right? And the yolk is moving back and forth inside of mm -hmm. that and it's hitting the inside of that eggshell. And there's really not going to be something you're going to be able to do to prevent that if you're shaking that egg. Tim, have you ever seen one of these vices helmets and what did you notice about it? Well, they look like NASCAR helmets. They, they're, they're a lot different than, I'm sure, some of the uh, uh, guys out here who played football. You guys remember the old suspension helmet? And then they went to the water helmet. We used to have water helmets, believe it or not, with these water bubbles that would protect your, your head and protect your brain, which was crazy because they were heavy and they would get hot. And then it went to the foam. 
And now, and I, I don't know all the different uh, uh, components in it, but it looks like a NASCAR helmet where it's fitted on your head. It looks like a, almost like a, a, a skull cap when it, it, it's actually contours to your head and the old helmets would sit on top these contour to your head. So they, they're great helmets. And, and in fact, I have a feeling that you, you had some at Notre Dame, didn't you? I think my son was wearing one of your helmets and I, I, I wish I would have brought that helmet with us. I didn't know that you guys were gonna yeah. have a helmet, but it's amazing to see the technology that are in these helmets nowadays. But just like the doctor said, you can never, on the sticker on the back of an NFL helmet, it says this will not prevent injury or death. And you have to, as a high school coach, the first meeting that you have right before you have a, a full contact practice with helmets, you have to read that and tape it so that you explain that, you know, we are not preventing, you know, all football uh, activities can lead into a result into injury or death. So it's that serious. Really an encouraging thing, uplifting thing to read before you go out in the field for the first time. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah it, and it, it's, uh, it's, it's something that you have to make sure that everybody's aware of that uh, there are consequences. And you know, the NFL has done a really nice job. In, in 2018, there was 214 concussions around the NFL. In 2017, there was 283. So it has gone down. Why has it gone down? Well, I think it's gone down because of the technology in the helmets, but also the NFL has done a nice job of legislating the big hit out of the game, where tackling is a lot different now than it was even five years ago, 10 years ago, where they're teaching different technique and fundamentals with the tackle, where you're not leading with your head. When I was taught to block, I was taught to throw my head across the body and throw my head into a player. Now they're taught to use their hands and you pass block and you run block with your feet and your hands, not with your head and your shoulders. Hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, we're sitting here, doctor, talking a lot about football, but concussions obviously are a part of lots of other activities to tell us about that. I mean, even cheerleading, right? Maybe cheerleading most of all. Yes, so I mean, I definitely have seen athletes of every single sport that have sustained concussions. I've had swimmers who have sustained concussions um, swimming. I mean, you wouldn't think, you know, that would be a very high risk sport. Um, cheerleading is actually very interesting. And um, when you look at kind of the sports, especially at the high school level, when they kind of record sports injuries, cheerleading is usually excluded from that. So if you're looking, football is obviously the highest, followed by women's soccer. Um, but cheerleading isn't included in that. And, you know, I see a lot of cheerleaders that get kicked in the head. I see a lot of cheerleaders that get dropped on their heads. Um, so it's definitely another area where we are seeing a lot of injury. Um, and there's something almost about the mentality of some of those, like those cheerleaders and those coaches. And, you know, it's like, oh, we can't stop. We can't stop. And I feel like in some of the other sports, they've kind of got that a little bit more. So I think that's where a lot of education has been really important. It Help me with swimming. How do you get a concussion when you go swimming? You know, you, I could probably figure out a way to do it, but you smash your head into the wall on okay. backstroke, you hit the ground accidentally. Die. I mean, how you did that driving in? I don't know. But. Do we know what the most dangerous sports are for our kids? Is there a list or ranking? So that's actually very interesting, and, and I did bring some statistics with me. Um, I won't share them all with you, but if this is something that you're interested in, um, the high school, um, let's see here, I, I wanna get it right. So the National High School Sports Related Injury Surveillance Study is kind of published every year, um, and they call it the High School Rio, so it's um, a survey that's done, and the most recent results I found were the 2017-2018 year. And when you look, and again, they, they don't have cheerleading here, um, but when you look, the highest injury rate is in boys football. Um, and then after that is girl soccer. Now, interestingly, when you compare sports, and this is for all injuries, but when you compare sports, um, girl soccer has more than boys soccer. Girls basketball has more than boys basketball. So, and that's another thing that we've heard about with concussion literature also is, is you know, are females athletes at higher risk for these injuries? And comparing some of these sports, it would seem that the answer is potentially yes. But we don't have girls playing football or contact football as much in this country. But so. that'll surprise a lot of people, what you just said. I think it will. I mean, I think a lot of people don't necessarily think of females as being, you know, as maybe serious of an athlete, and maybe their risk for injury is less, but that's actually probably not true. Yeah. Can you talk just for a moment, doctor, about what does concussion and repeated hits to the head, to, borrow what Tim was saying, what does that do to 
the brain? What, what, what's the consequence of that? So, and that's an area we're definitely learning more. I mean, we, we're talking about concussion today, but in our medical literature, we're talking also about sub-concussive hits, which is what, you know, what Tim was getting at, that you know, there's all these other hits that we're not calling a concussion, and maybe an athlete's not being removed from play, but at some point, those sub-concussive hits are adding on to each other, and yeah, you know, there is going to be an effect on the brain from those types of head contacts and injuries. You know, Tim, you can't help but wonder about the future of sport, you know, writ large here, you know, hearing you guys talk about this. What, what thoughts do you have about, I mean, it, it seemed like a year ago or so there was a lot of conversation about the future of the NFL that seems to have faded a little bit. Maybe it's because we don't talk about it here in Kansas City with the Chiefs <laughs> winning the Super Bowl. But, but what, what do you make of it all? Well, it's funny bringing up, uh, I had an offensive coordinator in 1994 that said that football would not last 25 years from back then because of a lot of these brain injuries and the concussions and some of the lawsuits and, and other things that have occurred. Now, he was wrong, but if you look at youth football, let me give you a prime example, and my sons both played football, CYO football for their, for their grade school. Each grade had its own team. So the eighth grade team had a, eighth grade had a team, the seventh grade all the way down to fourth grade. And it was contact football with helmets and shoulder pads and everything. And if you look at it now to this, fast forward to you know, 10 years later, it takes six different CYO teams, uh, schools to make one team. So people aren't playing. And that's why I think it's so important. That's why I love these discussions because High school coaches, college coaches, uh, NFL coaches, um, they're all mandated to take a, a concussion protocol class every year to look for the signs of concussions and, and uh, try to understand when your player is showing signs of a concussion and when they're not. And, you know, players don't tell you about concussions. Mm -hmm. They want to tough it out. You know, let's go fast, let's rewind back to 25, 30 years ago. Dr. Wackerly can attest to this. When you got your bell rung and you went to the sideline, that was a badge of honor. You know, you probably were concussed. And, you know, the trainer would come over and they would ask you a couple questions and you'd be able to answer those questions, you'd go right back in. So that has to change, it has changed. But there's the, the trust factor and, and parents they're not quite sure what to do. So if you're not quite sure what to do and you're not quite sure what's going on, then you tend to say, you know what, let's do something else. And there are plenty of options. Lacrosse has come out and it's become a big game. But lacrosse is quite a few concussions. There's a very high risk of <laughs> so, uh, And, you know, soccer. So, soccer. you know, it's, it's and, uh, the football and the NFL have, have taken a blow uh, in the PR department, but they've also, it's been good for the NFL because they've had to address these issues and pressure from parents, from players, from past players have been, has been so intense that they had to make changes and the changes have been good. Now, is it gonna stop all concussions? No, like doctor said, you're not gonna be able to stop all concussions, but the treatment of concussions a lot better now than it was 25 to 30 years ago. And Tim, this is no small deal given the, the macho culture surrounding the NFL traditionally for so many years. These are fairly seismic changes you're describing here. They are seismic. The seismic changes, we, there's some guys now that are retiring after three or four years in the NFL because yeah. they're concerned about head trauma. And then they realize because of there's an independent doctor on each sideline. It's not the team doctor anymore. It's an independent doctor on the sideline that doesn't answer to the GM, doesn't answer to the owner, doesn't answer to the coaches, doesn't answer to even to the players. If he makes a decision, you have a concussion, you're done. That's a lot different. So yeah, the, the machoism and, and, the, and the, you know, the bell rung and all those kind of things, that is being, washed out of the game, which has been a good thing for the NFL. And it's been, it trickles down, the trickle down theory to college and high school and, and, and to youth sports has been, it's been important. 
we have a long way to go, but it's been a lot better than it has been in the past. You know, John, I, I can't help but think, as Tim was describing, the decline in participation in youth leagues, for example, uh, what you guys were seeing at Vices, and as you projected out uh, any number of years, any, do, you, do, you, do you have access to that, what the future looked like for a company like Vices, given the decline in, in participation? Very limited. Like I said, I, I was much yeah. more in, in kind of the, the, the research and development end. Right. Um, we, we, we thought that it was going to be a more, uh, I thought we were going to hire sales than we did, but we, we attributed that more to it being uh, an inside sales market uh, rather, rather than there being a, a significant lack of, of purchasers. Right. Meg, I probably should have asked this a long time ago, but define for us what exactly a concussion is. All right. So, you know, I only brought a few slides. Okay. But, Great. Um, this is the current definition. So it's very short, right? Um, the current definition <laughs> of sports-related concussion by... Um, in the consensus statement. And so it was funny, you know, we talked about how we used to talk about concussions and there was all sorts of different protocols that were used and it was really just one expert saying, this is how you should diagnose a concussion or this is what a concussion is. And so now what we have, and again, as our science has improved is um, we have consensus statements and this is actually from the fifth consensus statement. So it's a group of sports medicine experts who study concussion, who practice, you know, sports medicine, who deal with patients with concussion. And they came together, um, and this was back in 2016, so they're probably gonna update it again in a few years, um, but to define what a sports-related concussion is. And so uh, they said sports-related traumatic brain injury that's induced by biomechanical forces. And then they said these are common features that we see in concussion. Um, so the first is that it could be caused by a hit to the head, but you can also see that it can be really caused by a hit anywhere in the body just with an impulsive force transmitted to the head. And so that's something that people a lot of times don't realize. They say, oh, I didn't get in the hit in the head, I don't have a concussion, but that's not true. You can get hit in the shoulder and it, it rattles you so much that it causes problems upstairs. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Whiplash. What's that? Whiplash. Whiplash, okay, great. So, yeah. yeah, so, you know, car accidents are an excellent example of a non-sports related area where you can see that force transmitted to the head. Um, you get a rapid onset of these short-lived symptoms, and usually that will resolve quickly for a lot of people, but then there's other people who maybe don't have their symptoms initially. As you were saying, your son at the time, he didn't feel that bad, but then later he started noticing more and more symptoms. So those can evolve. Um, it it's insidious in that way, right? I mean, it sort of creeps up on you in some cases. In some cases it can. And so, you know, I think a lot of that probably has to do with when you're in the game and you have that adrenaline and maybe ah. at the time you don't really feel it or you don't realize it as much. You got some adrenaline going during those games. Yeah, I mean, and the funny thing is, and I didn't mention this with Colin who had the concussion on, on, on Saturday at the game on Saturday playing Navy, uh, was, didn't feel great Sunday, went to practice on Monday and just could not do anything. Just didn't know the plays, didn't, couldn't mm -hmm. line up, couldn't do it. And they, they hurried him off the field. So it took till Monday for him to show that. And then from that point on, those little things were showing up. Yeah. Um, and then one of the other challenges with concussions is that this is really a functional brain injury. So there aren't a lot of structural changes in the brain. So with our current standard imaging, such as things like CT scans and just basic MRIs, those studies don't really help us diagnose concussion, and that's kind of what point number three is getting at, is, is that what our studies that we use regularly um, in the hospital today aren't going to help us with this diagnosis. Now, that's not to be said that in the future, there's definitely doing a lot of research, and there, there may be some, but right now it's very research-based. It's nothing that's clinical. Um, and then kind of the final thing that I think has been made more common is, is that, you know, these clinical signs and symptoms may or may not be associated with a loss of consciousness. So it used to be like, well, if you're not knocked out, you don't have a concussion. Well, now we know that you can have a concussion without loss of consciousness. So that's kind of long and wordy, but I think, you know, for this discussion today, it's good. This is kind of what I talk to people about a practical definition, um, trauma induced alteration in mental status that may or may not be associated with a loss of consciousness. And there are different levels of concussion, different types or not? So. 
It used to be graded. They definitely used to grade concussions like, oh, you have a grade one, two, or three. And that's kind of going back to some of the older literature. We've kind of gotten away from that. Every concussion is very different in every individual. And even one individual who maybe sustained a concussion two or three years ago can have another concussion, you know, two or three years later, and they can react very differently to that concussion. Yeah. There's a, a doctor in the audience here. I, I was chatting with him before our, our conversation here. But this idea idea that there's new technology on the way where a blood test or some sort of device that uh, looks at uh, blood composition can help you determine if there's been a concussion or not? Am I seeing that right? So that's true. I think that came out about a year ago and nothing against the media. But it kind of came out of, oh, here's a blood test that diagnoses a concussion. So in reality, it was a blood test you could use in the emergency room to kind of determine if you should get a CT scan on someone because you thought, you know, something was going on in your brain. So for what I do on the sideline and what all of, you know, the other high school, college, and even NFL physicians are doing, you know, for us, that's not something that's really clinically useful for our practice or for a parent, you know, that's not something you can't just go run to the lab and, you know, get this drawn. But, but isn't there advice, Dr. Barry Festoff I was talking to, he's here this evening, isn't that there's not a device you can just use on the sideline to do a quick test? A blood it, test? Well, some, Dr., where's Dr. Festoff? Yeah, just in a, in a nutshell, Barry, what, what are we talking about here? Let me, I'm sorry to interrupt, let me get you on the uh, audio for our live stream audience can, can hear you. Excuse me. Yeah, so what I was talking with Steve about, um, and, and what the doctor mentioned was the Banyan biomarkers test, which as, as she rightfully says, was overstated by the media as a concussion test. When it's always the media's fault. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You're move on. The media, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically uh, the way it passed uh, FDA approval was that it, it reduced um, radiation exposure by about a third. And that's a good thing because, you know, a lot of patients hit an emergency room uh, complaining of a head injury, whether it's a mild or not so mild, they're going to get a CAT scan. Am I right? That is they're correct. not going to leave the emergency room without it. And, and so if you could save that in 30 percent, then that's valuable. What we're talking about is, is a, a handheld device that uh, could, uh, through Bluetooth technology, transmit information you know, from that handheld device to a, to a HIPAA-encrypted central computer for access uh, by providers, by, by patients, by um, other individuals that would also contain not only the biomarker information but clinical features like uh, Tim uh, Gronhard mentioned the impact test and things like that. Right. Dr. Gibson, can you react to that? Does, does that sound like it holds promise to you? I don't mean to put you on the spot here. I'm just trying to guess. So I can't say that I'm familiar, I guess, okay. with exactly that specific test. When we diagnose concussion right now, I mean, there's not one single test that says you have a concussion or you don't. Um, and it's the same thing that the independent physicians are doing. Um, on the NFL sideline, you know, which is similar to what we're doing, um, you know, and high school athletic trainers are, you know, you have to use your clinical exam, you have to get a history from your athlete, you have to examine them. And then there is a multitude of other tools that we use. When I, when I teach fellows and, and people about this, I kind of say, you know, you have your concussion toolbox and there's all these tools in your toolbox. So you have to, you know, do your exam, you have to look at their balance, you have to test kind of their visual tracking, you have to test their memory. Um, you need to then, you know, kind of look at things like reaction speed, visual motor speed, and those are things that that impact test does in addition to um, looking at memory and things like that. Is that what happens when an NFL athlete goes into that concussion tent, some of those tests you're talking about? Well, I don't know. I don't personally do the <laughs> concussion tent. Yeah, um, I've never been in the tent. So. <laughs> He just told me to get back on the field. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, those are kind of the, the standard of practice. And so that consensus statement that I mentioned said, you know, and the American Academy of Neurology puts out a similar one and says, you know, this is the things that we should do to diagnose concussion. I'm guessing they're not sitting down and doing an impact test, you know, a computer test there, but they're using probably their clinical tools. Hey, John, it, at uh, your company, was there anything else being done, being looked at to help determine 
uh, when an athlete suffered a concussion or anything else on the cutting edge that might be useful for us to know about? Uh, sure. Uh, this isn't anything that we are doing at Vices uh, specifically. We didn't do a, a whole lot of uh, kind of human level uh, research and interaction, but right. we did try to keep pretty well appraised of what was happening in the scientific field. Uh, I, I think one of the things that will be really interesting, especially given where we started this discussion, which was with CTE and kind of the notion of chronic hits uh, and the notion that right now uh, concussion, we like to classify it as a binary outcome, but it's really not. It's not just as simple as somebody was concussed or they were not concussed. Right. Uh, and, and if we look at a couple of groups, uh, one, one that I have paid a lot of attention to is the Purdue Neurotrauma Group. Uh, and, and they're actually coming out, or they've been looking at mechanisms, and that's one of the things that's most important, is because if you want to try to control something, you have to understand <laughs> what causes it. And that's one of the things that we're really struggling with uh, concussion right now. Um, and, and of the things that they've published, I think the one that I've paid most attention to is what they call uh, the default mode network. Um, and, and that's referring to uh, functional MRI imaging, and, and it's basically looking at pathways within the brain and how they change before, during, and after mm -hmm. a football season. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I think that that's something that we really wanted to pay a lot of attention to uh, because they're starting to look at what happens with more every down type impacts, which we're very well aware of. But if we look at the current uh, standardized tests, they're, they're much more focused on the 99th percentile impacts that lead to concussion. Uh, and, and we can, uh, and, and we were kind of heading towards discussing, uh, you know, we may release multiple models of the same helmet that predict or that protect in different regions of impact because you only have so much impact protective material uh, and, and we can optimize a helmet for a 99th percentile impact but it will come at the cost of a 70th percentile impact and, and vice versa. Uh, and so I guess one of the big questions that I like to say, or at least discussion points, is bringing up why do people wear helmets to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, I think pretty much everybody agrees on the first one, which is let's prevent skull fractures and death. Um, but as soon as you go to the next one, people start to disagree pretty quickly. Because you might say, well, I really want to save my brain for CTE, which is great. But you might also have somebody who says my contract is on the line and if I get a concussion, my, my professional hopes are done. And so you might have two different individuals who have two different desires uh, out of their helmets and understanding, or at least giving somebody the option uh, in, in their protective uh, helmet is something that we've certainly discussed. Uh, and what that Tim, might that notion of a big payoff that you know, John is talking about here, how does that play into the experience you've noticed watching your teammates over the years? Well, it, it certainly uh, plays into some of the uh, decisions that are made about trying to f quickly get back on the field. You, you know, you don't want to be the Wally Pip where, you know, they take you out and you never get back in. Uh, but, uh, you know, you have to be able to be truthful with yourself and truthful with the doctors and the trainers. And that's not always the case. You know, people will try to buck the system a little bit. But I think that if we talked about it a little bit earlier with some of the guys that are retiring now after three or four or five years because they've had a couple concussions and they're worried about the long-term damage that they're doing, let's think just about some of the people that we know. Marty Schottenheimer, who has dementia right now, who probably was caused by you know, multiple hits and multiple you know, injuries and concussions to the brain. He was a player before he was a coach. That's, it wasn't the players just getting mad at Marty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that people don't think about, you have Alzheimer's, obviously, that has creeped into because of some of the injuries to the head. But people don't think about ALS. ALS is right now, there's probably about five or six guys that I played with that are in the final stages of ALS because of playing in the NFL. And they talk about this protein that is uh, uh, kind of, um, after your hits will seep into your system and it causes ALS. Uh, Tim Green, who is a, a, was a great friend of mine, played for the uh, Atlanta Falcons, is, uh, he's not doing very, very well. Uh, and a terrific was, NPR personality, so articulate about the game and, yeah. And, and an author. Mm -hmm, right. And, and an author, and it's sad to see, and there's about four or five other guys like that. So you, 
I think a lot of guys are looking and saying, okay, do I want to put myself in a position where, you know, in, in 25 years from now, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with all these, these different problems. So, yeah, I mean, people want to make money. That's, you know, when you get to the NFL, it's, you know, you only have a certain amount of time there. You know, most, the, the average NFL career is three and a half years. So, you know, there's a lot of life after that. So you're trying to make money, you're trying to be able to uh, keep your family uh, secure financially. So you're going to make some decisions a lot of times that aren't probably in your best interest. Why don't you wait for the let microphone me, here? Yeah, let me come by with the microphone. Eric's on his way. Well, I'm going to take your questions in just a few minutes. I think you've had cards to fill out, and I'll take those in just a moment. And if I'm tempted to say at this point, if you have a question, our phone number here is 816-235-2888. Yeah, go ahead, Barry. Yes, yeah, certainly um, uh, Tim Green and others that you have mentioned, you know, that are high-profile um, former NFL players with ALS, uh, either that contributed or others contributed to the fact that of all the diagnoses that the NFL Megasuit uh, looks to uh, at the top of the list is ALS. And CTE is actually towards the bottom of that list. Absolutely. And, and, and Lou Gehrig, there's a lot of evidence that Lou Gehrig had multiple concussions, but slide into second base and third base head first. And one of the reasons why Lou Gehrig's is even ALS because of way back when, you know, this isn't something that's new. It's just now being talked about, thank God. Yeah. Meg, how are we doing in, in, when it comes to training young athletes about uh, what a concussion is, what head trauma is, how they should recognize that, and what are you seeing in terms of hopefully improvements on that front? So, I mean, I think that the education component has gotten a lot better. Um, in the state of Missouri, when every high school athlete has their physical, and we do the same thing for all U our UMKC college athletes, they actually are, are supposed to, and I don't know if they do this, but they are supposed to read a page about concussions, about the symptoms of concussions, about you know what they should watch out for, kind of why they should watch out for these things, and then sign that they agree mm -hmm. to you know, tell people, yes, I think I got a concussion, or no, I don't think something is right. Um, now, as you know, Tim mentioned, there's still a lot of athletes who want to minimize symptoms and say, no, no, like I'm fine, I want to keep going. Um, and I think that will will always be there. You know, we kind of this culture we have around sport is you just tough it out. And so I think that you know we need to continue to educate people and say, you know what, like, no, this is serious. And if you're not feeling well, it's better to sit out and you know maybe miss one or two practices because um, maybe you don't have a concussion rather than you know missing months after that. So, so Meg, what's your bottom line when young parents come to see you with their kids and they ask you about you know playing sports and the dangers or the risk? What are you What are you advising these days? Yeah. So I mean, that's a con you know this concussion talk that I give or, or the, what I've talked to parents and, and patients about and. You know, it's something probably about every week I deal with because I always have a parent saying, well, should they go back to this? And, you know, so one of the things that we need to address is that in our country, obesity is more of an issue than sports related injury. Um, so, you know, if we're telling kids don't play football and let's say that's the only sport that kid wants to do, if he doesn't do anything, then the chances of, you know, him being overweight is probably far outweighing any, you know, potential risk maybe he had by playing the sport. Um, the other thing I tell people is, is, and I see it in my clinic all the time, is I see a lot of kids who have concussions not related to sports. You know, I see a kid, you know, I'm not kidding you, got hit in the head with a tennis ball in orchestra class and ended up having symptoms for like six months. In orchestra class? In orchestra class. Um, so, you know, you, you can't control everything. You know, we can't put people in a bubble. You could be walking down the street and slip on ice. You can get in a car accident. Um, so obviously there's things we can do to kind of decrease risk. And I, you know, talk to families all the time and athletes about, you know, making smart choices, about making sure, you know, that they're following the rules, that they're doing things correctly, they're using proper technique, um, you know, we talk to athletes about playing style. You know, if you're a kid who always dives for a ball, like maybe, you know, you shouldn't dive for the ball. Like I know that's hard to say, but you know, if that's gonna increase your longevity and your opportunity to play that sport, then maybe those are some smaller changes you can make. Um, because in general, I mean, I'm a sports medicine doctor, but I really do believe that the benefit of sport, you know, outweighs the risk. 
Ingrid from Portland, Oregon writes, I had a concussion a few years ago and I find that I'm prone to weather-related migraines. Is there any correlation between these two facts? I guess that's for me. Um, so I, I guess. will, yeah, I guess. Um, I will say, you know, that you know, even today, I was talking to someone, and their daughter had had a concussion in 2011, and she still gets, you know, kind of migraines and in, in dealing with headaches. And I think I talked to, you know, another family member here, and, uh, you know, we don't know exactly at this point, but obviously, you know, the brain was affected at that point. And if it's like, well, I never had this before, and now I'm experiencing it, then you know, there there potentially is something there. You know, John, how do you prevent possible false sense of security from improved protection like your company offers, which could cause risky behavior? How would you react to that? Uh, I, I would say I would look at what kind of more research that's been happening. So if we look at Virginia Tech, uh, they, they came out with their original risk function protocol in the early 2010s, uh, 2011, 2012, and that was based off of a little more than 300 athletes uh, over the 2007 to 2009 season. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we know that what happens to the brain is far more complicated than the linear acceleration that it receives, but it's something that everybody can relate to easily. Uh, the, the mean acceleration that was associated with the concussion was about 100 Gs. Uh, a similar study came out last year, uh, and it was starting to look at this notion of, uh, and, and something that we, uh, especially if you go into the automotive industry and you look at, at how people are injured in cars, we know that uh, biological variation is enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're starting to look down that, uh, but they've now looked at 500 players over the 2016 to 2018 season. So now there's rule changes, there's techniques that have come into play uh, and, and uh, this was associated with kind of two separate papers, so I'm drawing between the lines here, but the, the mean linear acceleration was actually 70 Gs. So one of the things that also associated with that, and this is between studies, was that the head impact count burden increased between, we, at least from my understanding, between uh, kind of the earlier studies and the later studies. Uh, that were conducted, and so that's another one of these things uh, when we look at concussion is it's not uh, talking about a binary event, it's not like turning on, turning on or off a light bulb. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's something that can vary with time, uh, and, and as you take a moderate, I actually don't even want to say that, but as you, as you take consecutive impacts, it affects the brain, uh, and, and that's one of the huge reasons why nobody should ever con you know, claim that they have a concussion-proof helmet because if you take a larger number of smaller impacts, you're, you're still affecting the brain to some extent. Uh, I mean, it was your company that labeled its helmets zero, which implied to me no concussion. Uh, starting from scratch. Starting from scratch? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Kind of in, in kind of the, the very kind of geek way that you start counting from zero rather than one. Another question for you, John. What does a typical football helmet cost? I gather that could be. Now, now it really depends on your level of play. Mm -hmm. um, if you, as you go into the professional level, it's not at all uncommon for them to exceed a uh, thousand even $1,500, that's actually become quite commonplace. Uh, many of the professionals are now wearing uh, custom fit helmets that, are, that have 3D printed parts in them, and so the whole kind of scanning wow. and printing process is quite expensive, and that's something that doesn't really scale well to the high school level. Uh, as you go down to the high school level, then, then I think the, the average sale price is going up, uh, but it's still significantly lower uh, in, in the probably less than 500. Tim? I could touch on that. I was at Bishop mm -hmm. Miege, and um, we had a certain budget uh, at the school to buy helmets, and every year we could buy 10 helmets or so. So we would open up to parents and mm -hmm. say, you know, if you'd like to buy your son a helmet, we'll get the Rawlings rep or we'll get the shut rep out, and they can give you a presentation. You can look at the helmet. And if you want to buy it, we'll recondition it, we'll take care of it. And after four years, uh, if the helmet's still viable, you can either keep it or donate it to the school. You'd be surprised at how many parents won't spend $500 on a, on a, a football helmet, mm -hmm. but yet in the spring, they'll buy an Eason bat for $600. So they're not, they're not buying a helmet to protect their, their kids' brains and you know, injury, but yet they'll go buy a baseball bat because they think their kid's going to hit a home run 
for six hundred dollars. So it, it's it's kind of funny how that works. You know, it's it's a you know we we talk about how important it is, but yet people don't put uh, their money where they really should, and that's in the protection of their kids. John, a question here: With all the helmet manufacturers that have gone out of business due to liability lawsuits, how can a company survive in this environment? Maybe the answer is it can't, because of your own well, experience. Well, that was, uh, li liability lawsuits wasn't wasn't associated with us. Uh, I, I I think it's entirely possible for for a company to survive. Um, why, why weren't liability lawsuits associated with with your company? I don't want to answer that. <laughs> I mean, all I would say how would your look, company look, avoid look at, something look, like that? Look at, look at what the last liability lawsuits in, involved. And, and I, I think one of the big things is, is we, we have continually kind of marketed ourselves uh, as, as something that reduces the forces of impact. And I think that's what's really, really central is, is that we, we have. You don't guarantee no concussion. And how could you? Yeah, is, is, right. Is the, is the really important okay. part. Um, can helmets uh, quantify concussion intensity and uh, accumulate that data over a, accumulate that data over a season or a career? That's already going on. Yeah, so that's that's where instrumented mouth guards are are really going. Uh, so what is that? So. Uh, one, of, one of the original systems is called the, quote, HIT system, where you have sensors embedded in a helmet. Um, one of the problems with sensors in a helmet, so this sort of answers the question, is, is that they have enormous errors associated with their measurements, like 30 to 60 percent measurement errors. So if it says you were subjected to a 50 G impact, it could be 25 and it could be 70. Mm. That's not that much of an exaggeration. Right. Um, so one of the things that's become popular is, is that if you, if you look at the, you know, the, the masticus, the, the upper jaw, that is a part of the skull. And so mm -hmm. if you find a way to put sensors on your mouth guard, uh, then now you have sensors that are, in essence, directly attached to the skull. And so the errors that you see, this sensor measurement errors, are much, much hmm. lower with those. Uh, and so I think that's one of the things that's really, it, it's at least a little bit of a race right now because the other thing is if you put electronics in something, now it's larger, bulkier, less comfortable. And so the, Tim, yeah. It, it's funny that you bring up mouthpieces, and mm -hmm. Dr. Rockley could probably talk about this. In 11 years, I never wore a mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. And really? the reason why I didn't wear a mouthpiece is I couldn't talk, and I, was, you know, I had to call mm -hmm. calls, and I was uncomfortable with them, and I never wore a mouthpiece. Never chipped a tooth until I was at uh, Kelly's bar and I turned around and somebody hit me in the mouth. <laughs> so that was on a Thursday night after one of my radio shows and I went to, went to the game, we were playing against the Carolina Panthers. After the first series I came out and said, I think I just chipped my tooth. So they had to pay for it. So that was... <laughs> <laughs> what is evidence that a change in helmet design can prevent a chronic traumatic brain injury? Um, why don't you just take that one, John? Uh, I, I think we sort of mm -hmm. been covering that where that so we're still trying to understand the mechanisms of chronic traumatic brain injury and, and before you can really understand the mechanisms you can't really hope to control or affect it will there ever be an effort to adjust the CSF cerebral spinal fluid density for temporary periods to allow less deceleration risk Wow I don't think so. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, you, you can attest it to it, but funny. the brain is very sensitive <laughs> Some of my pressure. colleagues and I have talked about that. We're like, oh, we should just find this way you can inject a little bit extra right before the game. I, yeah, I think risk of infection and death. No more injections, please. Would probably outweigh yeah. any potential benefit of that. Mm -hmm. Doctor, how about this one? Can you address the unique post-concussion challenges faced by older adults as a result of falls? Yes, so um, I do see a good number of patients with post-concussive syndrome not related to sports-related events. Um, and you know, it's interesting because even, not even necessarily in older adults, but even in just those who are functioning in the workplace, a lot of times we'll have people who are dealing with you know, chronic headaches or depression, um, difficulty kind of with eye tracking, inability to continue to hold their, their jobs. Um, in our older, older population, balance is an issue at baseline. And if you have a fall and then 
have concussive symptoms and your balance is worse, you can imagine how that can kind of be compounded by that. So, you know, all of the issues that we see in, in post-concussion syndrome in, you know, our younger, middle-aged and older adults can kind of be amplified, especially if you're starting, you know, with a maybe medically more challenging baseline. Just a couple more here. Which is more common, a concussion caused by sport or a concussion that wasn't caused by sports? Can you answer that one? I mean, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but I would imagine it would be non-sports related concussions. Um, it's interesting when you look at like how many concussions there are, it's like 1.8 to 3.6 million is like a statistic I think the CDC has on their website. I mean, that's a huge difference, right? Like that's a difference of 2 million right there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would imagine that most of those are not sports related. Do these injuries cause side effects related to language? They can. They yes, can. I think we, yeah. um, I was actually saying, you know, that a lot of my patients who are having maybe memory issues or speech issues where they can't find a certain word, will actually send them to speech therapists and well-trained speech therapists can definitely help with language and memory issues after concussion. I hold in my hands the last question for the evening. Discuss promising technologies to detect CTE prior to death. Any of you? John, anything? Uh, right now, I think the, the best thing that we're heading towards, I, this, this will be a two-part answer, is understanding that the, the, the pathophysiology and the pathomechanism associated with CTE and even Alzheimer's disease occur in everybody. Uh, they are more pronounced in, in people who are diagnosed, and one of the big things that's come out with CTE is being more focused on actual outcome measures. And so we, we certainly have, a, I think, a lot to learn from something like Alzheimer's, which is a much almost purely biologically based disease, even if things like repetitive head impacts influence it. Uh, and, and so finding ways that we can detect it uh, in, in a person is, is you know, challenging because you can look at something like Alzheimer's where you have a, a fairly large neuronal loss but the brain is able to con is able to compensate through alternate pathways, um, and so that's that's a difficult question if you're talking about something that exists in everybody, but the real outcome right. is personality changes. That's John Cagle, Dr. Meg Gibson, Tim Grunhart. Give them all a round of applause for being here this evening with us. All right. Good conversation. Thanks for the good questions. Appreciate that.